So uh, James Whitehorn is the Chief of Redistricting and Voting Rights Data at the U.S. Census Bureau. Prior to the po that post, he was the Bureau uh, Geography Division leading geography support to the redistricting data program, as well as the statistical areas group. Before joining the Census Bureau, James worked as the geographic, geographic Information System Analyst at the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, Cameron Sasnet is the General Registrar, and you heard this earlier, but I'm still going to read it, um, for the General Register for the Fairfax County, Virginia. He oversees and operates in a staff to coordinate voting registration and election activities for the county's 752,000 registered voters, of which I am one, and of which earlier today uh, he served as my witness for my absentee ballot. Uh, in Virginia, you have to have a witness for your ballot, so I will be mailing that later on today. Um, prior to his post, Cameron was the founder and CEO of ElectLogic Counseling and spent many years as an election consultant for various entities within Virginia. He also has a background as a firefighter and EMT and spent time as a combat fighter, firefighter in Baghdad, Iraq. Aaron Houston is legislative counsel for the National Association for of Latino elected officials education fund. She previously worked with groups such as Physicians for Human Rights, the ACLU, and National Partnership for Women's and Families, and devoted her career to protecting civil and human rights in the areas such as immigration enforcement, elections, education, and employment. She has also served as an election protection co coordination hotline and poll monitoring volunteer. Uh, Danita Kitamora, uh, is project uh, director for the Voting Rights Project for the Asian American uh, Advancing Justice in Los Angeles. She worked on issues relating to language access and voting protection and is co-author of the Voices of Democracy, Asian Americans in Language Access during the 2012 elections. Uh, Danita served as uh, on the Secretary of State Language Access Advisory Committee, Los Angeles Committee, uh, Community Voting Outreach Committee, and Orange County Community Election Working Group. Uh, Leonard Gorman is Executive Director of the Navajo Nation's Human Rights Commission. He oversees a team of professionals dedicated to advancing and protecting rights of people of the Navajo Nation. He serves as part of the Navajo Nation's delegation and participates in the review and development of the United Nations Draft Declaration on Rights of Indigenous People and the Organization of American States Draft Declaration on the Rights of Indi Indi Indigenous People and also the lead litigant and advocacy advocate for Navajo voting rights. And with that, I will turn it over to James. Uh, so I want to thank you all for having me here. Um, actually, I've, I've been involved with the Section 203 language determinations uh, since the 2011 round uh, that we released them. And this was actually the first time I was ever invited to speak about them publicly. So um, this may be a, a little less polished than what you would expect. Um, and, and Jim actually did a very nice sort of lead into some of what I'm going to talk about. So uh, I have a, a little overlap with what he he mentioned, and I may gloss over that and throw in a few things that were, were not in my original prepared remarks, uh, just to keep it interesting for you. So my role at the Census Bureau uh, in the Redistricting and Voting Rights Data Office is I act as the program manager over the redistricting data file, uh, but also the uh, citizen voting age population tabulation that we do annually, and then the Section 203 language determinations. Uh, that is the, pro the project manager for that as well. Uh, the Census Bureau takes our duties under uh, the uh, Voting Rights Act for Section 203 very seriously. Um, we basically start the process uh, by notifying the director that the time has come, that we need to get back to work. It usually happens about two years before the determinations are expected to be out. Uh, he puts together, uh, and, and this I'm speaking all in the, 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 the current tense, I can't speak for before 2011, but uh, he puts together a group that includes um, many different aspects of the Bureau that are involved. The, the head of the uh, research and methodology, methodology directorate at the Bureau uh, ends up being the chair over the statistical aspect. 
Uh, we have our decennial studies, uh, statistical studies division involved. They act as a uh, double programmer and as a quality check on the process. The Office of General Counsel is involved. Uh, and then my office is there to sort of make sure that uh, the trains are moving on time and that we're, we're going to meet our different goals along the way. So as you're aware, uh, the two or three language determinations uh, that require certain uh, states and political subdivisions to provide language assistance uh, for folks uh, to be able to effectively participate in uh, the electoral process. Uh, the first language provisions that we published uh, were before language proficiency. When we say language proficiency, the ability to speak English uh, very well, well, uh, those categories. Before that was on the long form of the decennial census. Uh, the data that's necessary for this came from the long form and now the ACS. Uh, the first listings which had that question uh, incorporated were the ones that were produced after the 1980 census. Uh, and then of course we did the, the determinations again in 1990 and 2000. In 2006, the reauthorization uh, extended the provision through 2032, but it instructed us on two big changes. One was to use the American Community Survey and other decennial data. Uh, so we make sure that when we're conducting these uh, calculations for the determinations, we are only using data at the Bureau that is considered decennial data or comes directly from the American Community Survey. Uh, and then to produce them every five years rather than every 10 years. And that creates a few unique challenges, which I'll, I'll touch on as we, we go through. Uh, so that was just the timing of release of all the, the, the ones in the past, all the Federal Register notices, which is when those determinations become official uh, and get the, the force of law. Uh, the, uh, just I put this up here because the, the next one will be in 2021, uh, and we expect that to be at the tail end of the year, so probably a December time frame, uh, but it's a to be determined in the future. The characteristics used. We first used the citizenship and voting age uh, because we have to get the uh, sort of eligible voter popu population in there. Uh, but then we have the language minority group, the ability to speak English, which is again that, that question with uh, the very well and well uh, and not at all. Um, and then we have educational attainment. Uh, one of the criteria is the illiteracy rate, as it's called, and that is uh, considered by the Census Bureau to be less than a fifth grade education. And so that's how we measure that. The areas that we evaluate are states. Uh, we evaluate the counties. Uh, in certain states, rather than the county, because the county is not responsible for elections in those areas, uh, we actually do the county subdivision. So that's for eight states there, and you can see them listed up on the slide. Mostly it's New England and then Wisconsin and Michigan. Uh, and then we also do the American Indian Alaska Native areas. So the way we do this is we actually use race as a proxy for language when we do these calculations. Uh, and that stems back to uh, some of the congressional record when they were putting this together uh, and how they identified which languages to be covered. Uh, and so we continue to use that today. And so in order to um, make this as comparable as possible with decennial data, we, we align with what is done for the decennial census. So when we did these calculations in 2011, we used the uh, the race categories as they were defined for the decennial census in 2010. Uh, in 2016, since we had not yet had another decennial, we used those same race definitions. Uh, and then in 2021, when we do the next release, we will base those on the uh, race definitions that are produced for the 2020 census. And this creates some interesting, um, a couple interesting scenarios uh, as we go through what the actual determinations come out as, and I think some other panel members may mention that here. If not, we can answer it during the, the question. Uh, you're probably very aware of the formula, how it goes with the 5% of the voting age citizen population and of the language minority group being limited English proficient or the 10,000 or more. Uh, and then that meeting also this uh, limiting citizen limited English proficient uh, and less than a fifth grade education, then that area is considered determined. Um, with the, I believe it was the 1992 um, uh, rewrite, uh, when the American Indian uh, category was added as uh, a geography in which to evaluate, uh, we actually do this in a, uh, as sort of a special second round. So we run through, we do the entire country at the state and the county and the county subdivision level. Uh, and then we go back and we evaluate the American Indian areas uh, as a whole. Um, looking at the legislative history language, it tells uh, that their intent was that the American Indian areas as represented by the U.S. Census Bureau uh, for the decennial census, and so we have interpreted that to mean both federally recognized and state recognized reservations. 
Uh, we calculate those and any, if, if that reservation is considered triggered or determined, uh, it's not actually the, the reservation that gets the requirement, it's any of the county subdivisions or counties that intersect with that, uh, that geography. So in order to make these calculations with the, the change in 2006, uh, with the, the sunsetting of the long form of the census and the advent of the American Community Survey so we can keep our data more current, um, we were directed to, to switch to the American Community Survey. So we, we do use that survey. We have to use the American Community Survey five-year estimates. If you're not familiar with the American Community Survey, we produce estimates um, for different levels of geography based on uh, our collection. So, uh, for very large areas of 65,000 or more, we produce annual estimates from an annual collection. Uh, for those areas that are smaller geography, we do a uh, five-year collection and then we create our estimates from that. Uh, when, we, when I use the term direct estimates, uh, what I'm talking about is we're taking an estimate directly from the American Community Survey so that that estimate is, is the same essentially as what would be in the American Community Survey. Uh, we do know that using a sample survey, uh, there can be considerable um, sampling error uh, or uh, as we report it through the American Community Survey's public uh, data products, margins of error around those point estimates. Uh, and so what the Census Bureau uh, has done to try to improve the estimates and to reduce the variance around those is we've employed small esti area estimation techniques. Uh, this is something we've done for decades in our small area um, uh, income and poverty estimates, SAPE, the, the program you may be familiar with, uh, where we use statistical techniques to uh, enhance the data to the point that we can get a better, var uh, lower variance. Uh, when we are developing our methodology, we do it on prior data sets. We don't do it on the actual data that the determinations, the, the, the current set of determinations will be coming from, uh, so that we cannot be aware of what those determinations are until the methodology has been finalized. And so what you end up with uh, is you have a final set of estimates that are used as the ones for producing the determinations. Um, we tend uh, with the models that we used in 2011 and 2016, uh, there is a slight difference in those two models, um, but the areas that are larger tend to be more closely aligned to the direct estimate, and for those areas with some very small populations, uh, tends to rely more on the regression estimate. And that's sort of a very broad statement about the statistical area. I come from a geographic background, so uh, the statistical side is, is not my strength, uh, but that's the best uh, way I can represent that. Um, the one slight difference between the two models that were used in 2011 and, and in 2016 is in 2011, we were obviously using the American Community Survey uh, data that was uh, came out right around the same time as the de decennial census, so we were able to use the decennial census in conjunction with that American Community Survey data uh, in, as part of a, a weighting scheme that was used to uh, reflect current populations. Um, when we are mid-decade, uh, we don't have that decennial census, and we have to rely more directly on the American Community Survey uh, as our source of information. Uh, so this is sort of one of the things I was just going to show sort of the same thing that Jim did about how it's changed over time. Uh, so we had 1977, which was our, our the first uh, estimates, and then of course, as he mentioned, uh, with the advent of using the limited English proficient qualification, uh, we ended up with uh, less coverage. Uh, and I'll just sort of go through these quickly since Jim already showed you something like that. Uh, I'm actually, you may be able to see that on the screen. Actually, I can see it on the screen better than I can down here. Um, what I wanted to point out is that my office tries to make as much uh, public data available to help people understand both uh, the determinations themselves, but we've also started, now that we have um, several years of electronic data that we can work with, to try to show some changes over time. And so I just took two samples out of uh, what we have. Uh, one is uh, how the three major categories have changed over time. Uh, a big trend that we noticed was that um, uh, although in the 2011 uh, numbers the uh, Hispanic coverage went up, it didn't go up as much as w was expected and so our American Community Survey folks went back to try to uh, investigate why that was, why wasn't the um, growth as expected and it turned out that the limiting factor there was citizenship. The folks that were being measured 
uh, did not have the citizenship numbers to pull them along into the equation to be able to be counted for determination. Uh, and so that was in the, the 2011 determinations. Uh, the other thing that, uh, that Jim also mentioned was that we noticed a decline in the American Indian coverage. Um, this is actually showing only a 1.65% decline between 2002 uh, and uh, 2011. Uh, but that's actually not measuring the number of jurisdictions covered, which is a table that we do have on our website available. Uh, but it's measuring the amount of the covered population that's covered. So um, it's a slight twist on a way to look at the data. Uh, and then again, we had another more significant drop in the number of folks covered when we went into the 2016. Uh, and then uh, this is just an example of another uh, uh, piece of information that we post there for, to try to make it easier for people to understand what's happening. Uh, this is a breakout of the covered language groups. Uh, and, and then how they've changed between each of the determinations, uh, how, whether there's more jurisdictions covered for that language, less jurisdictions covered for that language uh, going through. Uh, and so I, I just put this up so you can see that um, the uh, uh, census.gov slash RDO is my office's website, and it also has my phone number uh, on here, and I think you'll probably will get copies of these slides, uh, materials from the meeting. Uh, but uh, my office is always there to help you with uh, looking at some of these support products that we've put out. Uh, we also put out a public use data file. It's a little more cumbersome, but it has the calculations for each of the different components, uh, the, the LEP, the citizenship rate, the um, fifth grade education level, for every single jurisdiction that we calculate it for, unless it has to be suppressed because the population is so small. Uh, but we, we put, make that public so you can actually see, you can look at um, the uh, margins of error around the numbers. Uh, and then I have to add just one little thing about that is for the 2016 uh, product, uh, the public use file, uh, we are going to be reissuing that public use file. It turns out that the margins of error that we reported were over, overly large. Uh, so we have some folks who are in the process of recalculating those and we'll be pro posting a corrected file hopefully in the next month or two. Uh, so if any of you have already downloaded that and are using that in your offices, um, we'll have a better, uh, tighter variance on the numbers. It uh, doesn't affect any of the determinations, but it just affects the variance that we were reporting around it. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll let some other folks take over. James, thank you for clarifying that it didn't affect any of the determination numbers. Um, so um, again, uh, for those of you all who are either just joining now or uh, weren't here in the morning, uh, my name is Cameron Sass and I'm the General Registrar for Fairfax County. And um, I'll just uh, talk a little bit briefly about uh, what the new determination numbers from the ACS data have impacted in Fairfax County. Uh, so if you've never been covered for a foreign language, uh, here's sort of the process being the chief election administrator in a jurisdiction. Um, a press release comes out and uh, the whole world starts uh, pinging you and say, have you seen this press release from the Federal Registrar uh, and the Census Bureau? Uh, so you open it up and you take a look and lo and behold, uh, your locality is on that list and it's for uh, a language that you either expected or didn't expect. For Fairfax County, it was actually for a language that we actually did not expect. Our first expectation based off of our own internal demographics and, uh, and neighborhood and community data that we keep was that we would actually be covered for Korean before we'd be covered for Vietnamese. But lo and behold, there in the register was Vietnamese. So we opened up the wonderful public data that uh, the, the Census Bureau has available for us and we started looking and, and we wanted to see exactly where the numbers were and why the determination was for Vietnamese and not Korean. Um, and in looking at those numbers, we, we found that they were actually very substantially close to each other and that the threshold for Korean, um, the number for Korean was very close to the threshold. Uh, so we made a policy decision as a jurisdiction that if we were going to enact an Asian language that um, we're required to, that we should pick up one that we're almost required to. Uh, so we went ahead and based off of that, that data used uh, and made the determination to cover for Vietnamese and Korean. Now, 
Um, so the next step uh, in that process is that you get a letter from the Department of Justice that says, congratulations, you're covered uh, for language. And it's another copy of the Federal Register. Um, and in Virginia, as I mentioned earlier, we have elections every year. And then for those elections, we obviously have primaries. So from December to next week, we had an uh, opportunity to turn around and get all of our voting materials ready in uh, English, Spanish since 2011, and now Vietnamese and Korean. Um, it has been an interesting challenge uh, because uh, at the next step after you get that letter from the Department of Justice is you get a phone call and they want to know exactly what you're going to do and how you're doing it. Uh, one of the things that they don't offer uh, when they're asking questions is any guidance or advice. Um, <laughs> can I get that in writing? Um, let me check. <laughs> Uh, it was an interesting question, but it is, uh, it's interesting to have the same uh, entity that would actually be enforcing, trying to figure out if you're doing things right and not really giving you too much guidance. So we have to leverage very heavily on uh, what we had done in the past with Spanish, um, leaning on our organizations that are volunteer to help us out. We lean uh, heavily on staff within our own office. One of the great things about Fairfax County, as I mentioned earlier, is that we are a very diverse county. Um, and having a great workforce within the county, we have resources uh, that are able to look at some of our materials. Um, and even beyond just within the county, we have within our own office and our own officers of election uh, have been able to review a lot of the stuff. Um, so it, it has been a bit of a whirlwind trying to get things ready so that uh, for next week we have all the materials available inside the polling place. Um, some of the interesting questions that are still sort of unanswered are exactly the degree to which materials have to be translated, right? So we, we knew exactly inside the polling place when a voter walks in, whatever they see in English, whatever is in Spanish has to be in our, our new covered languages. But we step back away from the polling place and the things that aren't required by law to be there, such as uh, you know, our realtor signs. Um, there's no requirement in Virginia that says that you have to have a vote here sign. Um, and even within the county, we know that there are certain areas that are much more heavy in the Asian population than other areas that are more heavy in the Hispanic population. So we had to make a determination, while well, we have a fantastic set of resources and we are very well funded by our county, um, we had to look and say, where are we deploying these higher dollar resources that we're not actually required to do? We had to step back and also look at some of the things that we were doing that wouldn't necessarily make sense to have four languages on some of those things, right? And do we break that up into having four different ones? Perfect example is uh, some of the signs that we use for absentee voting locations. We make large um, absentee voting location signs. We put them out in the roadways. When we started doing uh, um, Spanish, um, some of our highway folks said, you know, you're going to distract drivers, right? And so because we start putting everything on one and then we start having more and more signs, um, so there are certain things that we're trying to make decisions on is that do we stop actually having those things because we're going to create a greater distraction or is it a benefit? So it is a huge challenge as an election administrator and being covered for an additional language as to knowing what you have to do, knowing the things that you want to do, and then knowing the things that you can do. Um, again, as I mentioned, we are very uh, uh, fortunate in Fairfax County to have resources to do a lot of things that we want and have to do. Um, but then starting to figure out is that where do we spend the best dollars to make sure that we're doing things right? Um, and so uh, no doubt that the next step in the, the process is going to be the same folks that we're calling and uh, potentially not answering a whole lot of questions but wanting to know what we're doing uh, are going to be looking and seeing what we do with the implementation uh, in our elections. So, um, you know, and it's one of the things that we welcome. Uh, we know that we're not going to have it perfect the first go around, um, but we know that we have been uh, putting a lot of effort and energy into making sure that we, we are trying our best to do it right. And so, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that I hope to take away from this today is input on some of the things that we're doing, uh, some uh, guidelines, uh, maybe some best practices, so that as we begin to adjust and readjust, we can do it better. So, um, so I definitely got to thank James for that, uh, that data that you guys published, because if it weren't for having that data, um, we wouldn't have been able to look and say, what is the best next thing to do. 
And for us, it was picking up a language that we potentially knew by the next census that we'd be covered. But more importantly, inside that data, we were able to look and see it's a larger Korean community. We know that they're involved. The data supports it. So it was a very easy decision for us to make. So, so with that, thanks. Um, thank you for for setting the precedent of uh, you know no PowerPoint because I'm following in that tradition. <laughs> um, a lot of information has been shared at this point about the the uh, bare facts of the new determinations, and so I'm just going to briefly share a few observations about the those new determinations, um, how they affect Spanish-speaking voters, and uh, some of the implications, maybe for where we go from here. Um, as you've all heard, uh, of course, most voters can communicate in English, but we still have a significant population of people who, who aren't able to. Uh, you've heard a little bit about the latest global statistics. Um, as noted, there are about 3 million native-born adult citizens living in the, the continental U.S. and D.C., um, and sorry, in Alaska and Hawaii, the, the 50 states in D.C. who aren't yet fully fluent in English. Um, and more than 7.8 million naturalized adult citizens who aren't who report who self-report that they aren't fully yet fully fluent in English. Uh, Puerto Rican migration to the mainland U.S. is, of course, one of the drivers of the increasing need for Spanish assistance in elections. Uh, as are increasing naturalizations, um, and to put a number on it, in FY16, for example, or sorry, FY15. Um, there were 783,000 80, uh, about naturalization applications received. In FY16, that number jumped up to 974,000 and change. Um, and as of the first quarter of FY17, we're about on pace to see the same number of applications uh, in the current fiscal year. Now, um, in the first place, some of those people at English proficiency is part of the, the naturalization process, and there's an English test, of course, associated with the naturalization process. There are waivers available based on disability, and interestingly, the number of uh, requests for disability waivers associated with naturalization applications has actually been declining, but I think we may see a, a pretty steady number of naturalized citizens, um, Latino naturalized citizens, who need language assistance with voting um, in part because we continue to suffer from a chronic shortage of English classes. Um, the level of proficiency that's needed to, to pass the naturalization exam and to become a U.S. citizen may not be the same as has been mentioned as the, the level of proficiency that's necessary to vote um, comfortably in, in English. Um, we've also uh, very recently opened up new waivers, um, new partial fee waivers, uh, and, and um, there's been kind of a, an increase in the number of, um, of waivers granted for, uh, uh, for people, for low-income people applying for naturalization. Um, some people are eligible for a, a waiver of the, the, uh, the cost of naturalization. And some of those people who are low-income who gained greater access to the naturalization process may be some of the people who, who aren't in that category of, of the more educated naturalized citizens, um, people who are more likely to need language assistance. Um, as you've also heard, the, especially the Latino community uh, is spreading out around the country in a really noticeable way. Uh, you heard about some of the, the places where the population is growing the fastest, especially in the southeast. Uh, to add to that, between the year 2000 and 2014, the state with the largest percentage increase in its Latino population, South Dakota. And you saw also in North Dakota, some of those, uh, some North Dakota counties were among those with the fastest growing Latino populations. So that means uh, in places where um, a community may be, may stand out a little bit more, um, in places where a, a Latino community, where the conventional wisdom isn't that there's going to be a large Latino community. There is increasingly a, a significant presence, and a significant presence of voters who are likely to need assistance with voting. 
So in accordance with these overall demographic trends, uh, as you know, coverage under Section 203 for Spanish language, at least, both increased and broadened in scope. And actually, overall, that was the trend for 2016 for the reasons that have been discussed. Uh, 263 political subdivisions are presently covered compared to 200, excuse me, 248 in 2011. 29 states covered in whole or in part in 2016 compared to 25 in 2011. And um, actually for each of the language groups, the number of, of uh, covered jurisdictions increased. For Spanish, traditional language assistance strongholds are the places that lost coverage. So there was a decline in coverage in Illinois uh, and then in Texas, New Mexico, Utah. Uh, Non-traditional states, on the other hand, were the ones that gained in coverage. For example, um, for Spanish, Georgia, Wisconsin, Iowa, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Idaho. Uh, ag again, as an illustration of language assistance strongholds uh, coverage declining somewhat, the Los Angeles is famously the most covered jurisdiction, the one that, that is covered for the most languages, and its number of covered languages declined somewhat in 2016 compared to 2011. Um, 23 counties were not, that were not previously covered uh, for Spanish are covered as of December 2016. And some of these are in states uh, that are long associated with a Spanish-speaking population, uh, primary, primarily Florida, the southwestern states, but a, a larger number or a, a significant number of them are places that uh, where the population is changing and, and language assistance needs reflect that. Um, I, it's really striking when you look at the, what these jurisdictions actually are. Um, I'll, well, I won't read them all off. <laughs> um, that they, they are uh, they're notably smaller population jurisdictions. Of the 23, po 23 jurisdictions I'm talking about, uh, four have a population at le of at least 100,000, only four of them. The average population of the remaining 19 jurisdictions is 9,695 people as of 2010. 14 of them have a population of less than 10,000 people. I think in some part, some of these smaller jurisdictions, I'm glad to see Welcoming America here and the, the link being made to what they do. I think some of these smaller jurisdictions are less likely to have the kind of resources that Welcoming America um, and other immigrant integration uh, oriented organizations encourage the flourishing of. Um, they're less likely to have resources that help people learn English as they're going through the naturalization process or, or uh, you know, just because it's a, a useful thing, it's a useful skill for anyone to have in this country. Um, and they're less likely to have the kinds of programs that Welcoming America uh, provides to help people fully integrate. Um, these smaller jurisdictions uh, and, and the unique challenges that they're going to present demonstrate that we need to, to really work, I think, going forward on empowering places where there will be relatively fewer resources and less experience um, to, to provide adequate language assistance and that in the process will also um, help us help make us more of the country that we all would like to see us be. Uh, to just to tip, pull out one example really quickly that I think was particularly interesting, Lincoln County, Idaho is one of these 23 newly covered jurisdictions for Spanish. Uh, you might not be familiar with Lincoln County, I wasn't. It's located in the central, south central part of the state. Its population, like these counties, like the typical newly covered Spanish county in 2016, its population is only about 5,000 people. Uh, and it's in a bit of a language assistance desert in the sense that there are no other counties covered in the state right now. Um, in 2002, going back to 2002, there were uh, a few counties in the state covered for Native American languages, but uh, no coverage as of 2011. Lincoln County has a growing and significant Latino population. Uh, it's up to about 30% Latino uh, as of the latest statistics. The factors in the growth of, of Lincoln County's Latino population seem to be uh, significant farming and dairy operations, 
the number of farms, the land uh, dedicated to farming in this county, excuse me, is, is uh, on the rise. Um, there is also a, a significant religious community that I think may be tied to the growth of the Latino community in, in uh, Lincoln County. Idaho is the, the second most Mormon state and 66% of churchgoers in Lincoln County are estimated to be Mormon. Um, the, po the Latino population in Lincoln County is almost entirely of Mexican origin, which means that uh, these are people who are moving, uh, you know, maybe come from families of, of longtime U.S. residents who are moving to this area, or uh, they're people who are naturalizing. Excuse me. <clears throat> they're people who are newly naturalizing. Um, so they're people that need the full spectrum of, of integration assistance, most likely. And they find themselves living in kind of a, a geographically isolated place, a place where we can imagine that the language minority community is fairly socially and culturally isolated. Thank you. So um, I just want to suggest that uh, there, it, there are institutions in a county like this um, and in the newly covered counties for Spanish uh, that can be that should be leveraged to solve the significant problems that implementing a, a good language assistance program in a small, lower resourced uh, jurisdiction will take. Um, and there are community interests here in a, a, a community like Lincoln County that, that want these things to happen. Um, when I started looking around a little bit to understand the community a little bit better, I started to find um, articles about uh, that kind of told you a little bit about the local debate over immigration issues. And there was more of a sense of pushback against anti-sanctuary measures in this local area. There was a real diversity of opinion you could see. So, so there are resources to be drawn upon and, and it needs to be done in a really, um, in a very intentional way because we're going to be working with a lot of relatively unexperienced jurisdictions in the coming years. Good morning. Again, I'm Deanna Kitamura with Asian Americans Advancing Justice Los Angeles. We're the largest civil rights organization in the nation working in the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. Uh, thank you to the Democracy Fund and EAC for hosting this summit once again. So I've worked at my organization now for nine, year, nine years, and so I've seen two determined nations come, come around. and I have to tell you there's nothing more that we anticipate in our office than that determination because it is so crucial to the work that we do and to the, the, com the community that we work with. In California, 56 of 58 counties are covered for some language assistance. We're fortunate in California in that in addition to Section 203, we have a state law with language assistance coverage. Um, that, that threshold is much lower than Section 203's threshold and the assistance that it provides is not nearly as comprehensive as Section 203, but it is something that we do have. And so, so language assistance is vital in California, 56 out of 58 counties. That's, that's a lot of counties. Um, and you'll see that under Section 203, we have 27 counties covered. All of those counties are covered for Spanish, and nine of the counties are covered for at least at least one Asian language. And we have uh, two counties that are newly covered for Native American, American Indian languages. Um, and then under state law, we have 50 counties that are covered. You saw a lot of statistics this morning, and the bottom line is that in California, over one third of Asian Americans and Latinos speak English less than very well. And so language assistance, again, is very important to, to our communities. But the, the one stat that I really want to press on is that not only is there this crucial need for language assistance, 
but that when it's provided, it's used. So in my office, we used to do exit polling on election day. Now we do post-election phone polling to actual voters. And we ask them if they used any language assistance. And in LA County, the response was that 32% of Asian Americans that actually voted did use some form of language assistance. Now that, that use varies by ethnicity. So you'll see here that 50% of Korean American voters use some form of language assistance, 46% of Chinese Americans, and 11% of Filipino Americans. And so, but when you, when you ask them in a much more broad way, did you use any form, like maybe a family or friend, those numbers jump up to, like in a Korean American community in, in LA, that jumps up to 60%. And these numbers are comparable to the numbers that we see in Orange County, just south of Los Angeles County. We see that in the Vietnamese community, the numbers are more than 50% using some language assistance. And so the needs there, and actually, folks actually use the language assistance that is provided. So my organization, along with our sister affiliate, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, ALC, we do poll monitoring, usually during the presidential elections. And this time around, we did poll monitoring in 25 counties, covering most of the counties that are covered for an Asian language. And um, another a group did a Santa Clara. And so we hit the largest, some of the largest counties covered for Asian coverage. Um, and so this time in November, we had 500, over 570 volunteers um, going to nearly 1,300 poll sites in California. We think that this is, was perhaps the largest poll monitoring effort in the nation in November. And what we found was that counties in, in California are doing actually very well in terms of providing translated ballots at the polls. And so we only found that 3.6% of the, the poll sites that we monitored were lacking translated ballots. So that, that folks were able to actually vote using the translated materials. However, the numbers decreased, well, the, the missing materials actually increased. It was almost 22% that were missing Section 203 supplemental materials. So that might be the voter bill of rights that, that are hung at, at at the poll sites. It might have been the statewide voter guide that's provided by the Secretary of State. So supplemental materials were missing. And so um, what we often do, our poll monitors ask that the materials be presented. So oftentimes what we find is that the English version is stacked right on top of the translated materials where nobody would know that the translated materials exist. And so what we do is our poll monitors are trained to actually do a little advocacy and say, hey, why don't you fan out the materials or why don't you display, look for the displayed um, the copy that should be pr provided. Um, and so, so what you see in terms of the numbers presented here are once our, when our poll monitors walked in, that was missing, not displayed. And those numbers are, re are reduced because of the advocacy that our poll monitors do. We also found that 8.2% of the bilingual poll workers that were expected to be there um, at the poll sites were, were uh, missing. And so again, good, good coverage um, and, and, uh, in, in the 25 counties that we went to. Uh, let's see. And, th and then there we also have some best practices that we've, we push. So prior to election day, we are sitting down with a lot of our county administrators and asking them to, we're asking about their plans for recruitment, we're asking about how, what they expect to do, we're trying to assist them with perhaps providing them um, ideas in terms of doing trainings better. Um, but we also push for some best practices. So for example, have the bilingual poll worker put a name tag on to explain which language they provide or have signage that, that explains that maybe they don't have a, a bilingual poll work on site, but they have an alternative form, maybe a hotline number. So we're asking them to provide some, some additional signage, and we found that, that they don't do as well in terms of best practices. Um, we keep pushing for, for that, and we'll continue to do that, but um, it's something that, that um, counties do need to work on in terms of that. Uh, we, we have an extensive poll monitoring report that we have out. There are some copies at the table back that way, as well as infographics. And we also have um, the colored version on, um, on the 
the website links that I have here, um, but I would be willing um, and, uh, and able to send folks copies if they need it as well. So thank you. Is there a stenographer in the audience? I don't care. Quest and eat Linigi, the eat Nil Sabe, a car now, what do the Nasha Aya, Picket or Tilly, Bass and eat Linigi? That's exactly the unfortunate experience about uh, indigenous language. Don't misunderstand me uh, because I've been in situations uh, many a times. I don't see here, okay? Deal cannot never last like Kagis Lizzie has lain at Niniki, the Kayaki is Highland, the Scarawan, yeah, I don't walk in language against Kigi. In that short period of time, I said, um, uh, before I look at the monitors, uh, thank the uh, US um, EAC program and the democracy um, program. And I also thank uh, the Pesquatami indigenous peoples that lived here where we're sitting here some time ago. And they've had El Guacan language and um, I'm thankful for um, their hospitality, although perhaps they're no longer here. Thank you. All right. She ya kin as the in slow this chin, but she's chin do she send you can better than the she came. And I introduced myself with my clans, my um, paternal, maternal grandparents who I am as, as a Navajo person. And I, I find myself in this situation many a times <clears throat> advocating for indigenous human rights. Um, stopping a conversation that's carrying on. And, and I say, I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know the course of the conversation that's taking place. Uh, this is in the midst of the Organization of American States and the United Nations discussions on indigenous people's human rights. I've been there. <laughs> and I apologize to those that predominantly speak Spanish uh, because that was the discourse uh, in the conversation and I had to stop it and I said, I don't understand you. Um, could we have a conversation in English? <laughs> How ironic, huh? Um, I direct the Office of uh, the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission, and I have seven staff, and it's overseen by uh, five commissioners. It was recently established as a part of the Navajo Nation government. And we have four mandates uh, to do public hearings, to educate Navajos about their human rights, uh, to assist, assist with investigations, um, conduct public education about human rights, and we also interact with a variety of international organizations. Um, I like to say I have friends in the State Department, uh, but they have been very silent <laughs> recently. <laughs> they don't want to talk to me. Uh, we are advancing the effort to 
have indigenous peoples and their governing institutes be recognized as a part of the United Nations systems. So the US government has become very silent in the past couple of months. Uh, they don't want to associate with me anymore. I bring to you a different context of language use and the need for recognition and the perpetuation, the preservation of language. My organization in the government, Navajo Nation, was just recently recognized and I'm headed down to Phoenix tomorrow morning uh, to receive an award, the Edward M. Kennedy uh, Community Services Award. Uh, as I understand, that's a, an interesting award nationwide selected from among a pool of participants and nominees. And I was totally surprised uh, as to why we were being awarded um, I bring to you the perspective from the international human rights perspective as to why it is important as to what you're doing, but unfortunately, it narrows down to one individual, one individual in a community. And, and that depends on who that person is and how that person is brought up, their belief system, and all, obviously all of the context of information that's shared here which was phenomenally great, but it comes down to one person. And I'll share with you why. Uh, so we've been an advocate in the world community under the context of human rights. Uh, the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights is a fundamental, interesting document the United States is a party to. The Covenant on the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination is also an interesting world treaty, which the United States is a party to, too. But unfortunately, those are just wonderful words that have very little effect in communities. Just back in September of, uh, December of 2010, after refusing to support the United Nations Declaration on, on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The United States finally said that yes, we support that document. Um, and it's, it's hard to explain why it's, it's, it's not appropriate for a nation that professes to be the world leader in human rights. Very interesting. Navajo Nation, as, as my brother uh, James Tucker presented, um, is situated in Arizona, New Mexico, a little bit of a strip of Colorado because the Four Corners is mislocated, <laughs> and um, New Mexico. Uh, Arizona has three counties that are covered jurisdiction, Apache, Navajo, and Coconino. New Mexico's seven counties, um, McKinley, and the Secretary of State of New Mexico is here. Uh, McKinley, San Juan, Bernalillo, Cibolo, Rio Reba, Sandoval, and Socorro counties. And even with these counties, uh, we've had struggles. Uh, we have had um, consent decrees whom have expired, and they have not been renewed yet. It's really unfortunate, and I'm really glad that the state of New Mexico is here in regards to, to these kinds of issues. And the state of Utah, we have one county, which is San Juan County. <clears throat> My office has been involved in a variety of litigations. Uh, we're currently in litigation at the moment. And we just got news, um, again, a couple of weeks ago that we, we need to participate in a lawsuit in Arizona again. Um, regarding voting rights. And we were very fortunate to have prevailed in New Mexico when we talk about redistricting the onslaught of 2021 uh, in, in the time when uh, there was recognition of the, um, the, the hammer that we had, uh, the, the Section 4 clearance requirement. And we were very successful in Arizona and also in redistricting 
Uh, but however, we have gone through a series and series of litigations uh, to try and uh, overcome the concerns between the Republican and Democratic parties. We're still in litigation in Utah. Uh, we've come to learn in 2011 that the, the San Juan County, Utah had not redistricted for ongoing 30 years. The U.S. Department of Justice had entered into a, an agreement with the county, and the county believed that all that information in the, in the consent decree is perpetual. The gentlemen that are sitting up here from the U.S. Uh, government have no effect in that county, zero, none. And all this information that's proliferating here has no effect in San Juan County, <laughs> Utah. It's very unfortunate that that's the case. And, and that's the reality in, in the weeds out there. We can talk about numbers here, which are wonderful, but it unfortunately becomes a numbers game that really don't hit the root of the communities oftentimes. It's very unfortunate that that's the case. There are 14,700 people uh, based on the census 2010 in San Juan County, Utah. Uh, I don't know, the new numbers that have come up say that there's, oops, there's a thousand more people <laughs> in county. Um, I don't know where that's coming from, but we've had not had the chance to anchor those numbers. 51% of that population are Native Americans, indigenous peoples. And as I introduce myself to you, how many of you understood what I said? That's my grandma, my grandpa, my brother, sister, uncle, aunt, that has a very difficult time understanding the English language, okay? As you did not understand what I'm saying, it's the same thing for a lot of our Navajo voters out there in the Navajo communities, including New Mexico, that simply don't understand what the heck is going on. So we have residents uh, that live that with those kinds of conditions in the, in the state of New uh, in Utah in San Juan County. And grandma tells me that I get the mail, yes, maybe once or twice a month, if I'm lucky, three times a month. And that mail that I collect sits on my dinner table until someone comes around to explain to me the content of those envelopes, uh, they just sit there. So San Juan County instituted um, all ma mail election and essentially did away with language assistance. There was only one person in the county, which is they profess to be the second largest county in the United States. Um, they only had one person to canvass the entire county. Uh, but of course, Navajos are concentrated in the southern part of the county. And we find that mail system is very weird on the Navajo Nation. I don't know if it's like that here in this county. Because if you live on the near Page, Arizona, in the Utah side, which is called Navajo Mountain, there's a little community there. They have a mailbox there. It's privately owned. And that mail that people deposit there in that building is shipped down into Arizona, down into Phoenix. At the Phoenix, it's, it's uh, date stamped. And it gets shipped all the way across to Salt Lake City. And the county seat is Monticello and it finally works its way down the letter to Monticello. So it will take like a good three or four days, maybe a week sometimes as the weather system is interfering, maybe two weeks to have the letter to, uh, delivered at the county seat. There was only one polling place that was left open on election day. For a family that lives in Navajo Mountain, which is the, the southwestern tip of the county, they will go into Arizona and drive at least four and a half hours to the county seat to cast a ballot. Now, getting to the point about who is the decision maker of all of this wonderful, wonderful work that we all do. In San Juan County, it hinges on one person, the county clerk. County clerk made a decision in 2013 to close all the polling places except one in the county. Because 
it is supposed to save money <laughs> and that Navajo families would have a better opportunity to understand the ballot with their family members interpreting the ballot. We talked about the level of grade that's required. The young lady in the back asked the question. And the very interesting way of trying to read uh, the ballot, uh, my brother Tucker probably can explain to me how, what, what it means, to, that language on the ballot. I mean, it's very difficult. A young kid that's 18 years old may have a, 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 a literacy proficiency in the Navajo language, probably does not understand uh, the verbiage on the ballot. It's all, all legalese, okay? So we have 51% 50, Native American in the county. 25% participated in one of the last elections, while the non-Native American communities had 51% turnout. That's exactly the, the aim of, all of, of, of these activities in regards to the individual having the authority to make that decision at the, at the local level. We've asked the county clerk several times, please change your mind. Reopen those polling places. None, until we went into litigation, the county decided to reopen some of the polling places. So, we even challenge the adequacy of our, my, my brother, that's, uh, I just call him my brother because that's the proper way to do it in the, in the Native American sense, uh, language pro assistance provider. And, and I appreciate the point that was raised earlier about the uh, accuracy of the translation and interpretation. That is equally important in any language. Uh, and Navajo language is, is, is a part of that need for accuracy. Um, just to give you an example of the context in which there could be misunderstanding. Um, <clears throat> In, in our community back in Window Rock, uh, I saw the stop sign, uh, the same shape of a stop sign. And in the middle, it didn't say stop. It, it, it said, in the context, it, too, it has two meanings. The word said, in, in context, it has two meanings, uh, and depending on the condition. So I immediately said, okay, wait. Uh, because of the condition on the ground, it said, wait. But a smart alley in the back seat says, what, I'm first? So the, la the word also means being first. <laughs> so that's really important in, in our line of work as far as language content is concerned, <clears throat> that it has to be accurate in, in context too. Um, we're trying to work with the U.S. Department of Justice, particularly, for example, in this lawsuit. They have been totally been absent. We've asked and asked and asked. I have another meeting with them at 2 o'clock this afternoon. They refuse to enter the lawsuit. And I think this is why they don't want to enter the lawsuit. In their manual about unwritten languages, it says, Many of the languages used by language minority groups, for example, by some American Indians and Alaskan Natives, are unwritten. With respect to any such language, only oral assistance and publicity are required. That really gets me going. Because Navajo language is also written nowadays using the English alphabet. And Navajo colleges and universities are churning out Navajo students with degrees in Navajo language. This whole system has taken a stop sometime back after the 1965 adoption of the Voting Rights Act. It needs to catch up with time today. And, and that's where I think I want to impress upon the Secretary of State of New Mexico that we need to think smartly. We need to think humanely. We need to think with time. 
because we are all smart people. And I think we can basically write a ballad in the Navajo language in, in, on the Navajo Nation and avoid this idea of segregation among the state lines. So in conclusion, <clears throat> I want to say that all of us sitting here, we all have to watch each other's backs. <laughs> because I was in an arena in which, unfortunately, we had a real nasty discussion um, about why Native Americans and indigenous peoples have to have some sort of specialty in the international arena. Why not me, because my color is black? We don't, we don't need, we don't have room for that and space for that. We need to speak together, work together, communicate together, and respect one another with our diversity. We're not a part of the civil society as indigenous peoples, because this is a massively discussion about civil society. Indigenous peoples are, indi are indigenous nations, they're indigenous peoples. And we have the right to establish our own media and our own language and have access to forums they're non-indigenous in our own language. Thank you. And the federal government under Article 19 of the UNDRIP. State shall consult and cooperate in good faith with the indigenous peoples concerned through their own representative institutions in order to obtain their free, prior, and informed consent before adopting and implementing legislative or administrative measures that may affect them. So Secretary of State, it's important that free prior informed consent become a basis of the relationship between indigenous peoples in New Mexico and all of those that have indigenous peoples in their communities, that that become the cornerstone of your relationship. Thank you. you all to uh, congratulate our panel again. Um, I don't think we have time for any questions, but what I would suggest is as we eat lunch, if you have any questions or want to continue the conversation, to do it at that point so we can get back. Um, I don't want to take away from any of the discussions here today. Uh, but the buffet will be in the back. Um, I want you to uh, congratulate our, our panel yet again. Um, <laughs> And we are to come back at 110. So have on back. And I want to thank you all. <laughs>